Well, here we are, uh, the class on Exodus uh, for beginners. This is uh, lesson number 13, the final lesson in the series. And the, um, the subtitle of this lesson is Aaron's Sin, Apostasy, Restoration, Completion, and Consecration. Believe it or not, we're going to try to cover all of those ideas in this uh, lesson. Well, first of all, it's interesting to note that the essential purpose for the tabernacle, the priestly family, the Levites, and the sacrificial system was to be clearly demonstrated by Aaron, Moses' brother, who had been chosen by God to serve as the first high priest. God made a covenant with the Israelites. He would provide them with land, security, and prosperity if they would obey and worship only him. The problem, of course, was that even though God was willing and able to keep his covenant promise, the Israelites were not. This was made painfully clear as the people and their high priest Aaron fell into sin as soon as the commandments and the plan for the tabernacle and the sacrificial system were given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. Knowing that the Israelites would not be able to keep their part of the covenant promise, God designed and gave them a system to deal with sin so they could actually remain in the covenant despite their weaknesses and their disposition as human beings to disobey God and sin against him. And so Aaron's story is sandwiched between the giving of the instructions for the building of the tabernacle and the actual building and consecration of the tabernacle. And I, I think that um, uh, the story is, um, is given between these two events to highlight this most important point that, uh, you know, all of the uh, uh, tabernacle and the fine uh, detail given for it and so on and so forth. Uh, this wasn't the point. The point was it was given to exercise the sacrificial system, which was given to help man with, um, with sin, help the Israelites with uh, their uh, sinfulness. So we begin with the, um, uh, with the apostasy itself, talking about uh, Aaron. Aaron was a uh, great servant of God and he was the first man chosen to serve the nation as a whole in the capacity of high priest, uh, along with his uh, sons who would also serve as priests. Like his younger brother Moses, he would not live to enter the promised land. We find that out about Moses in, in Numbers 20 and we find that out about Aaron also in Numbers uh, 20. Uh, Aaron was much loved by the people as they wept and mourned for him 30 days uh, when, when he died. Let's uh, look at uh, Aaron's uh, failure, uh, which is described in Exodus chapter 32. So we'll set the scene that led to Aaron's great failure. The people have been miraculously delivered from Egyptian bondage and are now camped at Mount Sinai in the Sinai wilderness. God has miraculously led them uh, with a pillar of fire and a cloud of smoke. He's miraculously fed them water from a rock, the quail that appears, the manna which is there each morning. He's also communicated with the people through signs and awesome wonders and has spoken to the people concerning his instructions and his laws. They were aware of these. The people have been given general instructions about their worship, the place of worship, and that Aaron and his sons will serve them as priests. There's now great activity in the camp as the people begin to collect all of the elements that will be necessary to actually build the tabernacle. And so during this time, God calls Moses to come up to Mount Sinai, where he will be given the tablets upon which God will inscribe the 10 commandments. 
And Moses will also receive detailed plans for the building of the tabernacle, as well as instructions concerning the, uh, the sacrificial system. Moses has now been gone for 40 days and 40 nights, a period of time that the people find too long. It's during this critical absence that Aaron fails in his leadership and priestly role. Note carefully what happens. Let's first read 32, beginning in verse one. It says, now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and uh, brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Note carefully what happens here. The people having nothing to do become restless. All this talk of God and worship, but nothing happening while Moses was gone. They wanted a religious festival, a religious activity, much like they had in Egypt. And they wanted Aaron, the priest, to provide one for them. Of course, the tabernacle and all the elements and the system of worship had not yet been given to the people. Moses had been receiving these from God on the mountain for the last 40 days. But the people wanted to celebrate now. They saw no reason to wait for Moses or instructions from God about what they wanted to do. And anyways, they had Aaron. Wasn't he supposed to be their priest? So Aaron, who was raised in Egypt, knowing Egyptian ways about religion and festival, uh, festivals, tries to pacify a seeming revolt by giving in to their demands. Remember, however, that he's the spokesman, but Moses is the leader. God speaks to and instructs Moses, not Aaron. Aaron may not have known how to hurry along the completion of the work, but he knew who the divinely appointed leader was. And he knew enough about God's ways to know that he and the people should wait. Instead, he collects gold from the people and creates a statue of a calf. A better word here would be a young bull. Uh, that represented Apis. Uh, Apis was a familiar image representing fertility, prosperity, and strength, meaning uh, Apis was a familiar entity to the Egyptians, uh, representing these things in their society. Note in verse four that the people say, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The people were acknowledging that it was God who saved them, but in their ignorance and their spiritual immaturity, they broke the second commandment and they assigned the Lord's identity to one of their Egyptian uh, deities, Apis, and its image of a young uh, ox. In the next verse, Aaron carried along by the enthusiasm of the movement built an altar upon which he as a priest would have offered sacrifices. And he declared the next day to be the festival that they had asked for. I mean, he was just doing his job. But as I say, uh, in doing his job, he broke the second commandment, which uh, is printed on uh, the um, slide here. It says, 
you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in the heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. And what had Aaron done? Well, he had made a likeness of a young bull to represent uh, God uh, who had done all of the miracles uh, among them. Now, as far as pagan gods were concerned, this was a creative masterpiece in no way meant to offend God. It was man's idea of what God wanted. The intention was to quiet the people and give them a legitimate and satisfying worship experience. How many times have we heard that? We just want to have a more satisfying worship experience. Well, this is what Aaron uh, was uh, doing. Of course, things go wrong quickly. The people revert back to their pagan ways learned in Egypt, where they often mixed immoral sexual activities along with their religious practices. The situation degenerates as the people go from idolatry to excesses in indecent conduct and eventually to rebellion. Well, thankfully, Moses at this point intervenes. And so we read in chapter 32, beginning in verse seven. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and they have worshiped it and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and I will make of you a great nation. The scene switches back to the mountain where God informs Moses that the people have reverted back to their idolatrous uh, ways learned in Egypt and condemns them as being obstinate. Some Bibles have the word stiff necked like animals who refuse to wear a yoke or a bridle or humans who refuse to yield uh, or to obey God. As a result, God threatens to destroy all of them and to start his plan all over again this time with Moses taking the role of Abraham. After all, time is of no concern to God. He's never in a hurry. So in Exodus 32, 11 to 18, we see Moses interceding with God on behalf of the people, arguing that to do so would cause the pagan nations to doubt God's ability to fulfill his promise to the patriarchs. And so we read that God relented, meaning he changed his course of action in response to Moses' prayer. You know, God can and has and will change his course of action based on prayer. I mean, that's why we pray, isn't it? We have examples of this in the Bible. Hezekiah, for example, uh, is told that he has a disease. He doesn't have long to live, he's about to die. And after being told that he was going to die, he begins to pray fervently. And after his prayer, God gave him an additional 14 years of life. God relented, uh, changed his uh, mind, if you wish, and allowed him to live uh, longer. Uh, you read about that in 2 Kings chapter 20. In our example, God was going to totally destroy, um, or another example rather, God was going to totally destroy Sodom and Gomorrah back in Genesis. But he relented and he saved Lot's family after Abraham appealed to him in prayer, Genesis uh, 16. And so in the same way, God does not destroy the people for their sins, but he sends Moses back to the camp to stop the fast deterioration of order among the people. So we continue reading. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger burned and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. 
He took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Then Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from, Egypt, from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. I always smile when I read that particular passage. I just threw the gold in and out popped the calf, right? So Moses returns and he shatters the tablets with the 10 commandments in his anger and it destroys the idol and he confronts his brother. Note how Aaron, this great man, given great honor and responsibility, note how he responds to his great failure. To begin with, he doesn't even have the courage to own up to his own sin. His excuses are weak and they multiply his sins. For example, he says, they forced me to do this. You know how they are. That's just manipulation. He's being manipulative in suggesting that Moses would have probably done the same thing. You know, you know how they are. You would have done the same thing. He, you probably couldn't have resisted either. Next excuse, he says, it's not my fault. I just threw the gold in the fire and out popped the statue. Of course, that was a, just a bald faced lie. Verse four says that Aaron took a graving tool and fashioned it into a molten calf. And then the third excuse is pretty common one. You were gone and I had to do something. He's shifting the blame now. It was really Moses' fault. In other words, if you would have stayed, none of this would have happened. So because of his weakness and failure and sins, we read further on about the consequences of this episode in Aaron's life. For example, the people committed a great sin in violating the covenant they so enthusiastically agreed to barely a month before this incident. And true to the covenant's terms, they were punished for it. 3,000 men lost their lives that day as a, a countermeasure was begun by Moses to stop the spread of the religious rebellion which grew out of the disorder brought about by the pagan worship practice in the camp. Moses called on faithful men to step up and the tribe of Levi stepped forward to answer the call and they put down the rebellion and were rewarded by God in that future priests and servants of the tabernacle and later the temple would exclusively come from the tribe of Levi. Therefore, we have Levi, the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, you know, all, that's how the Levites came to become the chosen ones who would serve uh, in the tabernacle or in the, in the temple. Now, in addition to these consequences, Aaron's own reputation and standing before God, before Moses, and of course, before the people was severely compromised. I mean, he was the one to be, he was the one chosen to be a minister unto God on behalf of the people, but he had disgraced himself with this terrible and very public failure. Of course, we know that Aaron's story does not end here. We're going to pick it up again a little further on, but first we need to switch to the scene or switch the scene back to Moses as he struggles to reorganize the people in order to carry out the plans given to him by God on Mount Sinai. And so in chapter 32, we read about the restoration that's made. Once order has been restored, Moses returns to God and confesses the sin of the people and accepts the fact that if God were to condemn them, he should include Moses as well. The reason being Moses was accepting 
his responsibility of blame as the people's leader. You know, the buck stops here. He was the leader of the people. And in the end, if there was trouble and rebellion, so on and so forth, he was the one uh, that was ultimately uh, responsible. We read that God reassures Moses that he knows who is guilty of sin and his punishment of removing them from his book of life will take place eventually. So far, he has punished them in three ways for their sins. First, Moses made the people drink the water corrupted with the ashes of the burned idol. This as a symbol of their combined guilt. Next, the Levites, as I had mentioned previously, had killed 3000 of the people's leaders who had fomented the start of a rebellion among the people. And thirdly, God sent an unspecified plague on the people uh, of which we have no details, but we know that it took a toll on the population. As we go on in Exodus chapters 33 to 35, their journey continues. Once God has punished uh, the people, he instructs Moses to resume the journey to the land he has originally promised them. However, he threatens not to go with them because they are so stubborn, he might destroy them on the way. And upon hearing this, the people finally show remorse. And so we see in Exodus 33, seven to 23, Moses interceding for the people. Previously, Moses would speak with God in a special tent outside the camp. God's presence in the tent was signaled by a pillar or a cloud. This was before the tabernacle was built. Moses uh, uh, meets with the Lord to ask him once again to relent and accompany the people on their journey, realizing that without him to go forward would be futile and arguing that without his presence among them, they would be like every other nation. They would lose their distinctiveness. Once again, God relents and agrees to remain among them, at which point Moses asks for and receives a special viewing of God. As he passes by him, Moses sees uh, the back, God's back, if you wish, but not his face. In explaining this passage, one uh, commentator wrote, in vivid pictorial language, the passage says that man may see only where God has passed by and so know him by his past doings and acts. I thought that was a very succinct way to describe what takes place here. And so Moses receives renewed instructions in chapter 34. At this point, God gives Moses a new set of tablets with the commandments, and he renews his intention to remain with his people but to perform mighty works among them as well. He also renews the covenant with them and he adds other conditions and warnings about mixing pagan nations uh, or uh, mixing uh, with pagan nations, uh, which would lead to uh, idolatry. In other words, he forbids them uh, to intermarry and to intermix with the nations uh, around them uh, for fear that they would once again uh, go into idolatry. And then he finishes by giving Moses instructions uh, concerning uh, various feasts, the Sabbath, and also uh, the offering of sacrifices. Moses then returns to the people to relay these instructions. And the text says that as a result of his time with God, Moses' face was shining, so much so that he would cover it when he spoke to the people. And so finally we arrive at chapter 35 uh, where uh, Moses describes the work of the building of the actual tabernacle. I mean, we've had a lot of information where God is giving him the plans of the tabernacle and describing the elements and the uh, uh, objects that would go in the tabernacle. Well, now all of that information is repeated, but this time, 
is repeated in the context that the tabernacle is actually being uh, put together. And so in the last chapters, 35 to 40, uh, Moses provides the details concerning the actual building of the tabernacle. It is a repeat, as I say, of the instructions already given, except now uh, these plans are being used to construct and assemble the tabernacle for the purpose it was created. And that was to worship God and deal with the sins of the people. Ironically, the very first person to have his sins cleansed will be Aaron, the high priest. So we pick up Aaron's story as we fast forward to the completion of the tabernacle in chapter 40, and that is Aaron's consecration. After all is built and set into place, the following instructions were given to Moses in chapter 40, uh, verse 12. It says, then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister as priest to me. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them and you shall anoint them even as you have anointed their father that they may minister as priests to me and their anointing will qualify them for a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. Thus Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. So here is this man, Aaron, this miserable failure who failed at doing the very thing he was chosen to do. He was chosen specifically to serve as a minister, to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. He is the one who led them into sin and nearly caused their destruction. Well, this same man will eventually offer a sacrifice for his own sins and then begin his task of offering sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. After Aaron is prepared to serve, Moses summarizes uh, the assembling of the tabernacle complex and finishes the book of Exodus by describing how God communicated with the people. And we read again in chapter 40, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the uh, tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and there was fire in it by night in the sight of uh, all the house of uh, Israel. So this completes our study of the book of Exodus. But before we finish, I'd like, as we've done in a couple of these lessons, I'd like to draw a couple of lessons, this time from Aaron's experience of failure. And then the series will be yours. First of all, even great people fall. Even great people fall. Aaron was chosen by God. He was given power and position, but this did not guarantee a life without failure. God can use us to serve him, not because we're great, but because he is great. That's a, that's a good lesson to learn for the A types, the overachievers, those who have succeeded in many areas, they need to understand that they too can fail and fail very badly. When they do, they need to realize that God can still use them even after they failed because his love is greater than any of our past successes or any of our failures. Another lesson we learn from Aaron Failures are never forgotten, but they are forgiven. Poor Aaron, his failure is forever recorded in the Bible for all to see. 
But Aaron would go on with his life and ministry because God forgave him his stumble. Some people think that you know, so long as they can remember their own or somebody else's mistakes, there's no real forgiveness. Aaron's story reminds us that we need to focus more on God's forgiveness instead of our failures if we wish to regain our confidence for the future as well as the ability and the desire to forgive other people. You see, people who don't forgive themselves have a hard time forgiving others, even if they want to. If you dwell mainly on your or someone else's failures, you will never succeed at forgiveness and receive the healing that comes with forgiveness. A third lesson, failure lays the groundwork for improvement. Aaron learned a hard lesson from the episode with the golden calf. It was a lesson that prepared him for the rigorous ministry of the priesthood. His, his failure improved his capacity for understanding and compassion. Despite the splendor of the tabernacle and the divine mysteries of the sacrificial system, aside from the beauty and the commanding presence of the high priest's garments, Aaron never lost sight of the fact that like the people he represented, he too was only a frail human being in need of God's mercy. This lesson had been indelibly stamped on his heart through failure and he was a more effective minister and compassionate man because of it. And so from start to finish, the Bible tells and retells the story of man's continued failure at keeping God's commands. It also recounts God's continued effort at forgiving and restoring a failed humanity. This should give us confidence to approach him the next time we think we failed too badly to ask for forgiveness. Whether it's the first time uh, that we ask for forgiveness in repentance and baptism in Acts 2.38, Peter says to the crowd, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the first time they're coming forward and asking God for forgiveness in Christ's name. So whether it's the first time you're coming for forgiveness and mercy, or it's the 50th time you're coming for forgiveness and mercy, as a Christian, John speaks to Christians in 1 John 1 verse nine, when he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is always faithful to forgive and to have mercy on us for every failure. This is something that we should always remember about the God that we serve, the God that we know about and that we've learned about in the book of Exodus. Now, some of you may uh, want more information uh, about the tabernacle. If you've noticed, uh, I've not gone into great detail in describing the construction and how the tabernacle was put together and the meaning of each object, each object in the building of the tabernacle, uh, each object had significance, the colors had significance, the materials used had significance, spiritual significance. I did not touch any of this simply because of time constraints. We only had 13 lessons to get through the 40 chapters. Thankfully, uh, we have uh, some bonus material and uh, you can access that bonus material uh, at the link that is provided at the bottom of your screen there. If you go to that link, uh, you will get a special um, a, a special uh, documentary type of um, a video uh, that will uh, go through uh, the building and the putting together of the tabernacle 
and give the meaning of all the different objects uh, as well as the sacrifices uh, offered. Um, this is a piece of uh, work that was created by one of our elders, uh, Bob Chilton, and I'm sure that you will gain a lot of information from this uh, uh, bonus material on the tabernacle. Well, I want to thank you for uh, your participation, those people in class, uh, people uh, who watch uh, online. I hope that this lesson has, uh, or this series of lessons has been a, a blessing to you and uh, has edified you and given you uh, some uh, insight into uh, this, uh, uh, this amazing book, the book of Exodus. So I uh, pray that God bless you and I will see you next time when we, um, when we tackle another uh, book of the Bible. We'll see which one that is. Until then, bye-bye.